Be seated there where you're at. Sit yourself down there where you're at. Make yourself comfortable because I like to make people uncomfortable. Those who are comfortable, I like to make uncomfortable. And, uh, and those who are uncomfortable, I like to make comfortable because that's what a good homily, a good sermon is supposed to be. It's supposed to comfort the discomforted and to uncomfort the comforted. You know, it's um, very important uh, for us uh, to remember during this time of isolation how important it is for us to, while we may be isolating in place, not to isolate ourselves from other people. During this time of social isolation, I think all of us are realizing just how important touch is. How important touch is in our life. The ability to be touched. I remember visiting prisoners at Pelican Bay State Prison when I was pastor in Crescent City uh, on the border of Oregon and California. And as I was baptizing, I did baptisms there in prison. I did confirmations. I did anointing. And as a part of the uh, prison at that time, it doesn't exist now, but they had a, uh, something called the Segregated Housing Unit, SHU, S-H-U. And as I was anointing during a baptism, a man who had spent dozen a dozen years in the segregated housing unit spending 23 hours a day out of 24 hours completely stuck in his cell i touched him with the holy oil and we use oil as catholics all the time and i touched him with the holy oil i touched him with the holy oil and when I touched him and I anointed him after his baptism, he began to cry. You know, we use oil as Catholics. This oil that I have here is the oil uh, for uh, anointing of the sick. But we anoint during baptism. We anoint people as they are dying. It's very important for us to anoint. And as I was anointing him, he began to cry. And he tells me, I haven't had anybody touch me in 12 years, he says. I haven't had anybody touch me in 12 years. I remember once being in a uh, beauty salon. And a woman came in, and all of a sudden I hear this crying in this beauty salon. And the hairdresser says to, says to the lady as she was uh, washing her hair, she says, am I hurting you? Am I hurting you? Why are you crying? And she says, no, it just reminds me as you are caressing my hair, as you are washing my hair, she says, it reminds me of how my husband used to touch me. The power of touch that we as human beings, we don't just need food and drink to keep us alive. We need human contact and human touch. We need intimacy. There have been studies done on newborns that have found that newborn babies can survive way longer without food and drink than if they are deprived of human touch. These studies were done particularly in the 1970s. The need for human touch, that which Mother Teresa brought to the dying people, the forgotten people, the people who were left to die by themselves there in the slums, people with leprosy or people uh, who had these debilitating diseases, 
that which she brought them was dignity through human touch, through touching. This is one of the ways that Jesus healed. He touched people. He healed through touch. The woman who had the 12 years of bleeding problem. You remember that lady that was bleeding for 12 years in the Gospels? And Jesus healed her. She touched him. She wanted to touch him. And, and, and when, when she touched him, the flow of blood stopped. You know that word in the Bible that says that she had this debilitating disease. It was like she had something that was scourging her. She had something that was beating her. And it was because the bleeding issue during that time for a Jewish woman rendered her untouchable. Not even her own children could touch her. Can you imagine not being able to be touched for 12 years? Just like this prisoner that I met at Pelican Bay State Prison, this woman also had this and, and Jesus touched her. She touched Jesus. It was through touch that healing came to her. He gave her back her dignity her ability to be touched. This was my experience in the orphanage in Oaxaca. When I lived in Oaxaca in Mexico, I spent time in an orphanage and there the children rocking themselves like this by themselves. The children who were not being touched. You see, we need touch more than we need food and drink. Don't you remember Jesus saying that unless we become like little children, we shall not have life within us? We will not have the kingdom of God within us unless we become like little children. And little children, all they always want is to be touched, to be held. How hungry we are for human interaction and intimacy. How hungry we all are to be touched. Right now, there is grieving family members who hunger for the consoling embrace of their loved ones or friends. Can you imagine? I think the greatest tragedy that somebody who is dying of COVID-19, of the coronavirus, is not the fact that you're dying because you can be comforted through medicine in your you know the pain can go away but that that pain of the soul that that's where our faith comes in you know because we know that that there is more than just our physical flesh that we have but but we have a soul can you imagine the pain of having to die by yourself without being able to be touched by your husband or your wife or your children and you dying there alone that is the real tragedy isolation i know this myself right now as i have to isolate how i hunger right now for the shake of somebody's hand how i hunger to shake my neighbor's hands how i am aware more now than ever of my own hunger for touch and jesus shows us a life where the brokenness is not fixed but held together and given meaning where healing is offered through what? Through relationships, through a community, where we together as his body walk together, where we touch each other with our hands. That's why part of so much that we do has to do with ritual and touching oils, sacred oil, 
to touch, to anoint with warm and comforting words, with smiles and embraces. We come together as a community in the sheepfold around our shepherd to touch each other. That is why we need to stop with this notion that church is about people walking around all being put together. No, we are not people who are put together. We are broken. We are a broken body of Christ where we are broken pieces all held together and given meaning. We need to stop with this pretend attitude in church where we want people to be happy and put together as walking advertisements, you know, that this Jesus stuff really does work. You know, sometimes you can look at people in church and, and they want to be walking advertisements. Look at me. I'm all put together. I have faith. You know, uh, sort of like a, a bunch of uh, robots with uh, fake facades pretending like we have it all put together because we are church people. And what is worse, that this kind of cure-all attitude leads to a culture and an environment where often abuse is perpetuated through cover-ups and corruption to protect reputations and to protect an image. We have seen this before. We have to stop with the pretending. We are all broken people, all of us. The world, so many people say, is watching in the church. So let's hide our dirty laundry. As one woman told me when I was pastor, also in... Uh, uh, in Crescent City and Father Eric Freed was murdered by a madman in the rectory in Eureka and this is just a neighboring town there and this was January 1st of 2014 when he was murdered and of course I was fearful can you imagine not only was he murdered but he was tortured and I won't get too much into it right here but that filled me with great fear and i talked about it because it was painful for me and one woman came to me and she says father we do not air our dirty laundry in public she said we do not air our dirty laundry in public. In other words, quick, let's sweep it all under the rugs. Let's pretend like we have it all together. The world is watching. Let's hide the mess. But if the world is watching, I want us to tell the, the world the truth. And you know what the truth is? And the truth. The Bible says, will set us free. Only the truth and nothing else. And the truth is that the church doesn't offer a cure or a quick fix. The church does not offer cures or quick fixes. The church offers oil. An anointing. The church offers healing, not a cure. The church offers death. The church offers death and the church offers resurrection. Death and resurrection. That is the messy and inconvenient work of death, the cross, pain and suffering and resurrection. Grace. Anything else is snake oil. Anything else is snake oil. It's fake. It's not the real thing. And how many friends of mine in the priesthood have committed suicide? Just recently, you all know about Father Evan Harkins. I posted things on Facebook about him back in February who committed suicide. My own age, he would be celebrating his anniversary this year. He's celebrating from heaven. 
Even when I was in the seminary back in Mandelein, Marcin Kozłowski, and you can Google his name, was a fellow seminarian who hung himself. So much suicide. Isn't this what we are hearing? Is the great tragedy right now during this isolation? Suicide hotlines are off the are ringing off the off the hook. They can't keep up. Doctors say they can't keep up with the demands for depression and anxiety medication. Let's stop the pretending and face what we are going through. And church is not about giving people an epidural. No. Faith and church is like a midwife. Faith doesn't take the pain away, but sits with us through the pain. Healing is not an event, but it is a journey. And we proclaim as Catholics that it's not a one-time boom. I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, and everything is great in my life. No! You know how people say, all you need to do is accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And then great. Repeat these words. Jesus, I accept you into my heart. And now my life will be wonderful. It's not like that. And you know it. If it was like that, why would I have friends of mine committing suicide in the priesthood? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't mean that you will have no more problems. No, but that we walk with our problems and we walk together with our problems, together in community. Today, in other words, we have the, the month of May is so very special because it is the month dedicated to Mary. And I, I absolutely love our Blessed Mother because She's our mama, you know. It's so good to have a mama, you know. She our mama, okay. That's what we are doing today. We're accepting Mary as our mama. You got her there in your house. You should all have a picture of Mary in your house. Because you don't just have a daddy. You have a mama. So if somebody tells you one day, you know, that you don't got a mother, you have a mother. Her name is Mary. And what does a mother do when, you, when you're sick? She sits there. She comforts you. She tries to make it better by being there for you, by cuddling you. She puts honey on the medicine that is so hard for you to swallow. You know, that's what a mom does. I, I, I like to always think of, you know, uh, when a child is scared at night, and they're scared and because they've had a bad dream or something. What do they do? They run into their parents' bedroom. They run into their parents' bedroom and they climb into bed with their parent, with their mama or their daddy. And, and it's the presence of the parent that comforts the child. Not that the parent is taking, going inside and taking the fear away. No, it's the presence of the parent that is making the darkness better. That is making the darkness bearable. That is making the fear go away. What is it that comforts you? The presence of your mama. See, you got a mama. And Mary is your mama. That's what we are doing today. From the cross, Jesus looked at the beloved disciple. And you are that beloved disciple. He looked at that beloved disciple and he says, Behold your mother. And the Bible says from that hour on, the disciple took Mary into her home. Now, the word took there is the Greek word, which means he accepted Mary into his home. Not the physical home, but the inside home. The home which is your heart. We have to accept Mary to know that we are not alone. And we as Catholics have a mother 
who's always there for us. And that's what we're doing. We as Catholics are so blessed. Today, in that first reading, we, it talks about baptism. What are we to do? We are to repent. Repent of our wrongdoings and accept baptism. And as part of the baptism liturgy, I often like to think that instead of saying all the time, you know, I baptize you, we should also say, I kill you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I kill your old self, your fear-filled self, your worldly self, and I give you the new self, the self of Jesus in you. And you know what else? I, 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 the, the Orthodox Christian faith, the, the Orthodox, our Orthodox brothers and sisters, they, during their or, uh, baptism liturgy, you know what they do? They spit evil in the face. Poo, poo, poo. That's what they do. The priest has to poo, spit. So you spit Satan in the face and you say, no, God is my daddy. I am his beloved child. And then you get anointed during the baptism liturgy. We always anoint people. See, we love oil. We like outward signs of inward realities. That, those are the sacraments of the church, our rituals. We anoint sickness. In other words, we anoint our problems. What does that mean? We make them holy. We anoint our sufferings. We say suffering is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Don't you read the second reading today? He suffered for our sake without words or empty solutions. We say with the oil, the touch, the anointing. What do we say when we anoint people who are sick? What do we say? What did I say to that prisoner when I was anointing him? What do I say to the dying person? Do I say much? No. I anoint the person and the touch without big words. What do we say? This is a big deal. This is a big deal. I am here. The church is here. God is here. You are not alone. When I go to visit uh, people who are sick and the family members are there and everybody, and oftentimes, you know, sometimes priests go and they, they have these books and they read and read all these lengthy prayers, you know, all this. I, I just do the bare minimum what is necessary there. Because when I leave, you know what the people are going to be saying? Father Adam was here. He came. They ain't going to remember much of what I said. They're going to remember the anointing that I was there for them. And that's what God does for us. He's there with us in a world of cure-all and quick fixes with pills and magic diet. You know, take this and you'll be great. You know, magic diet pills, magic exercise machines, magic potions to get rid of your problems, psychics that will tell you your future, plastic surgeons that will fix you right away and you will just be happy. You know, they're going to lift it all. You know, you're, they're going to lift your chin. They're going to lift your nose. They're going to lift it all. They can even lift your butt for you. You know, and uh, or inject Botox in there, you know, and you'll be all great. It's all going to be absolutely wonderful and you will just be so happy. Oh, it's <laughs> that's the world we live in. The pretend world, as the first reading today says, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Save yourself from this world that offers you quick fixes. Save yourself and come to Jesus. Come to the shepherd. Save yourself from this corrupt world where hooking up will solve your loneliness. This world that equates intimacy with sex. That says all you need is just to hook up with somebody. That's why people are hooking up today. 
That's the culture we live in, the hookup culture. Supposedly that, you know, having sex is going to solve your loneliness. And you know that it's not like that. You know it. People are looking for intimacy. And that has nothing to do with sex. Many of my friends who were, who were priests who left the priesthood to get married can tell you it didn't solve their issue to get married or to find somebody that didn't solve their problem because you're not looking for sex, you're looking for intimacy. And those of you who are married, you know what it's like. We're looking for intimacy. And if you don't find intimacy, you can't find it if you're looking for sex. You have to look for intimacy in your life, in community. You can't solve your loneliness with a hooking up or with the casino thinking that you will instantly become rich. That is the wolf. You're going to the wolves. The wolves are interested in exploiting you. That's what the casinos do. They exploit people, vulnerable, lonely people. Go in there and take a look. I lived in Las Vegas. I know what it's like. The bars do the same thing. The nightclubs do the same thing. All those places, they exploit lonely people. The bottle exploits lonely people. Drugs and drug dealers, they exploit our inner fears and our loneliness and our need for community. The internet does that in a horrible way. How many people are on the internet filling their voids with pornography? And when do they do it? When they're isolated, when they're by themselves, alone. We live in a world where the faith healer is going to give you a cure instantly for your ills. How many people watch those faith healers and, you know, and they promise you instant, instant cures? Or where money will make you fulfilled and happy or where the one vacation is going to do it all for you. And so you go thinking for the next vacation. You, you fill your void with stuff, with shopping You're always buying stuff. You woke up this morning and you looked at your closet and it can't even fit in there. And you, what'd you tell your husband? Honey, I got nothing to wear today. I hope they open up the stores because I got to go shopping. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like that one lady who was in the, in the mall with her husband and, and they were just going to take a walk. You know, because sometimes it's too hot or too cold to walk outside. So they were just going to go for a walk in the mall. And she promised him she was not going to shop. And then, you know, the husband went away somewhere, you know, I don't know. And she secretly bought a dress. And the husband found out because, you know, the Bible says, whatever you do in the dark will come out into the light. Uh, there's nothing that happens in the darkness that is not going to see the light of day one day. And he says to his wife, he says, honey, I thought I told you. I thought we had a deal. You weren't going to buy anything. And she says, well, the devil made me do it. The devil tempted me. He made me buy the dress. And he looked at her and said, well, honey, why didn't you tell the devil? 
what the Bible says. Get behind me, Satan. Why didn't you tell the devil? Get behind me, Satan. And she says, oh, honey, I did. And the husband says, and? And he told me it looked even better from behind. <laughs> That's the world we live in. Where we think that the new car or the new gadget or the new dress, the latest item, the new iPhone will make you whole and not wanting anymore. And the church proclaims that suffering is holy and anointed. It's our commission to heal in suffering, to be wounded healers. Jesus is the sheep's gate in order to enter into the sheepfold. Did you notice what he's called himself today? And I'm ending with this because I need to explain this to you. This is something that you need to get real well, okay? Jesus says, I am the sheep's gate in order for the sheep to enter into the fold. The sheepfold is the church, but not the church as a building, but the church as a community. The Greek word for church is ecclesia, which means community. And we can only have the abundant life. Did you notice John 10.10, 10, the ending of the gospel verse says, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. That's what Jesus wants you to have. The abundant life that he came to bring us. Where? In the sheepfold. In community. Outside of the sheepfold, you only find death. You only find death. Outside of the sheepfold, outside of the community, you find predators, you find wolves who want to harm you. Outside of the sheepfold, the sheep are devoured by hungry wolves. If you have learned anything by this isolation caused by the current pandemic, it is that we need community where there is life. We need one another because outside of the community, there is death and gloom and darkness. Baptism isn't just about forgiving us our sins or taking away our original sin. It makes us members of a community outside of which we cannot have life. Outside of the community, there are thieves and robbers wanting to steal your soul. And for you to become one of them. Did you notice Jesus says you will become thieves and robbers? Because we have a saying in Polish. And I don't really know how it goes in English. It goes, z jakim przestajesz, takim się stajesz. Did you get that? Did you learn that Polish? Come on now, this is Polish here. Polish lesson. Z jakim przestajesz, takim się stajesz. I, I used to be told that all the time. That's your Polish lesson for today. Z jakim Meaning, if you hang out with a person, you're gonna you're gonna become like that person. In Spanish, we say, uh, "Dime, dime con quién andas y te voy a decir quién eres." Okay, es, eso des, um, all my languages are coming out right now. <laughs> but anyhow, so if you if you hang out with alcoholics, you're gonna you're gonna be an alcoholic. Okay. In other words. If you hang out in the casino, eventually the temptation is going to get there. So you start punching the buttons, you know, all of that. All right. I remember once um, when I was living in Las Vegas, I had friends who used to visit all the time. And, you know, I mean, I, I'd go with them and I usually would just sit there. And, you know, they'd be playing because they thought it was so wonderful, you know. Cause, okay. And uh, anyway, uh I just get the drink, you know, you gave a dollar to the, or a couple of dollars. I was generous, okay, to the cocktail waitresses. And then you get, you could get all the drinks you wanted. And if you were even more generous, they'd bring you more drinks. So, uh, but they were there playing away. And one of the cocktail waitresses, I recognized her from church. And so I walked up to her and one of my friends who was a priest, he was there playing at the machine and he, Right before I went up to the cocktail waitress, 
he he told me he says isn't this wonderful nobody knows me here nobody knows me here nobody knows who i am it's so great to come to vegas and and to visit you and to be here nobody knows me here so i go up to the to the cocktail waitress and i said listen could you do me a big favor you see that guy sitting over there he's a priest okay do me a big favor <laughs> <laughs> go up to him and say, hello, father. <laughs> I thought he was going to die. I told him, so I go up to him and I say, now remember, whatever happens in the dark comes out into the light. But If you hang out in casinos or nightclubs or anywhere, you're going to become like that. That's why we have to hang out with communities that build us up. We have to hang out with people who build us up. Positive people and create those communities. Get yourself into great community building efforts. Like choirs or um or i i know people friends of mine who are part of dance clubs but like dancing clubs not you know dance clubs where you go and drink but where you where you dance together where you sing together there are great ways throw dinner parties at home create community that's what god wants for each and every one of us there are so many wolves out there looking for your soul in the corrupt world we live in. The world of non-stop shopping, the internet world, the world of constantly being out and eating out and not being with family. And what is Jesus saying today? Life is only found in community. Life is only found where the shepherd is. So are you shepherding your own community, your own home? The bottle, money, your work, fame, Hollywood, the casino, the nightlife, or the life out, or drugs, the bar life, the gossip life, the fear-filled life, the shopping life, the vacation life, the life of plastic surgery, the life of addictions to food or your body image. All these are not your shepherds. And when you make them your shepherds, that is the focal point of your life. That which you have lead you and drive you. You turn them into thieves and robbers in your life. And they eventually rob you of your life. And only Jesus, the good shepherd, leads us to life and life in abundance. So why does Jesus call himself the sheep's gate? Because remember... There was the temple in the Jewish world. That was the most important uh, part of Jewish life was the temple where sacrifice took place. Remember the temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed in the year 70? Well, uh, at the entrance of the temple was the sheep's gate. And as you were entering there, why was it called the sheep's gate? Because that's where the lambs were. You needed to get a lamb in or buy a lamb at the sheep's gate. And you entered the temple with your lamb because you were then slaughtering the lamb. The lamb was slaughtered and the slaughtering of that lamb, that lamb being slaughtered made you worthy, gave you the right to be there in the temple. It was the slaughtered lamb that made you worthy to be in the temple. Who is our Lamb. Jesus, don't we call him the Lamb of God who takes away our sins? Jesus is our Lamb and he makes us worthy. You are worthy. Stop listening to all those voices in your life that have told you you are not worthy. You are no good. You are worthless. Stop listening to all of that. He has become your Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. And he turns himself into our Lamb, hands himself to us, 
and says, I am making you worthy because I love you. I love you so very much. You are mine. The lamb that has made us worthy. If there's anything that should give us dignity today, a sense of belonging, is the lamb of God who now will come to lift us up in this holy mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as we profess our faith.